This is a very rare and very proud occasion. We are bringing into being today a very new and needed instrument to serve all the people of America. This legislation establishes the 11th Department of our federal government, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He knew what he wanted to do. He lived it. You know, remember, he was elected to Congress in 1938. In 1938, there was no running water and there was no electricity in the hill country where he grew up for the first 20 years of his life. We can argue or talk about voting rights and we can talk about school rights and employment rights, but one of the things that touches Americans most deeply was housing. Where do people live? A great deal of emphasis was placed on the unrest in cities because there were riots in Detroit, there were riots in Washington, D.C., cities were burning. So it was a difficult period through which this country moved. I came to HUD and really loved the place. Uh, the first piece of legislation that the president signed was the uh, Housing and Community Development Act. And uh, he really believed, and I thought he was right, that the block grant program was exactly what the country needed, that we would waste no assets. We couldn't waste a nickel. Sometimes I think the H uh, uh, in HUD doesn't get enough billing relative to the U. Uh, the housing that HUD's responsible for is in every community across the country. HUD is more than just housing. It's education and transportation. It's economic development and a clean environment. It's about giving folks the tools they need to build a brighter future. In less than a lifetime, in less than my own 57 years, America has become a highly urbanized nation. And we must face the many meanings of this new America. Between now and the end of this century, our urban population will double. City land will double. In the next 35 years, we must literally build a second America. Fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. I think the Fair Housing Act has taught a couple of generations of Americans, at least leaders, that this is part of the American dream. I mean, it seems so elementary to have fair housing. But HUD is out there day in and day out trying to enforce our fair housing laws and trying to make sure that people get treated fairly when they go rent or buy. Well, I, I came into HUD at a pretty explosive period of time, right? The housing market was blowing up. Uh, the world was in the middle of a financial crisis. And HUD's uh, place in history was very important at that time. Without FHA, the devastation that we saw in our communities and our housing market would have been dramatically worse. I have no doubt about that. The men and women that live on our street, it's not them and us, but it's we. Um, it's not therefore, but the grace of God go I, but rather there go I. It's really important to reflect on 50 years of the incredible work of HUD. And the reason I'm saying that is previously, before there was a HUD, it was unimaginable in our country that men, women, and children would be homeless. It was just unthinkable. Thanks to President Johnson, the Congress of that era, some of the experts and leaders across the country, they took to assemble all of the disparate pieces that might exist out there, such as FHA leading the way, but then all of the other things we were doing related to urban renewal and, and, and community development and, 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 and rental housing and mortgages and pulled it all together uh, in a department that I think has proven it is an important part of the American story. HUD is the department of opportunity. Everything that we do, everything that we do, whether it's working, 
with our local communities to revitalize them or helping to ensure that responsible borrowers can get their first home or helping after a disaster has struck, we ensure that Americans can reach their American dream. I'm Bob Wilson, the Interim Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs here at UT. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special occasion, the commemora commemoration of the 50th anniversary of President Johnson's creation of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We are particularly privileged that Secretary Julian Castro uh, is sharing this important moment with us here at the LBJ School and the LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, this is going to be an exciting event, and I think some of you out there are probably young enough to know how to tweet. If you tweet during the event, please add hashtag LBJ HUD 50. LBJ HUD HUD 50. Uh, but in addition to recognizing President Johnson's role in the creation of HUD, it's important to remember that as a congressman, uh, President uh, Lyndon Johnson was very involved in the Housing Act of the 1930s. Uh, as a result of this Housing Act, the Austin Housing Authority was given public funds to build the first public housing in the United States. Uh, in 1939, we have residents moving into Santa Rita, Santa Rita Courts, the Rosewood Courts, and a year later into Chalmers Court uh, in East Austin, and these facilities are still being used today. Uh, as articulated in the video, uh, the policy responses to urban challenges must incorporate a multitude of perspectives. Uh, and as here at UT, the way we describe this is, uh, we must adopt interdisciplinary approaches. For example, President Johnson understood that the war on poverty had to be comprehensive, involving initiatives in housing, education, including ch early childhood education, job training, health services, community development, and urban redevelopment. Uh, the challenge of, uh, challenges of urban America are still with us. Uh, in this morning's session of the Reimagining Cities, uh, we had a very good discussion about affordable housing strategies, sustainable neighborhoods, uh, access to good jobs and to schools, looking both here uh, in Austin, our particular challenges, but we were thankful also that we had a group from the purpose-built communities explain about uh, experiences in other, uh, in other cities. Uh, and we all wish to applaud uh, Mayor Steve Adler for being a leader in this effort. Uh, but new, ur new urban challenges have emerged since uh, President Johnson's period. One of the primary ones that we face today is resilience of our cities to natural disasters. Uh, we've recently reflected on uh, the rebuilding of New Orleans after Hurricane Cretina, and we all remember uh, the devastating earthquake uh, in San Francisco in the 1989. Uh, we are pleased to uh, be presenting now the president of University of Texas, Greg Fimbus, who is very much involved in this as a civil engineer. While at the University of California in Berkeley, he led a project to improve the seismic safety of utility and transportation systems and other urban infrastructures, and these are important in the development of the urban resilience. Uh, please join me in welcoming President Finvis, who will introduce our distinguished guest of honor. Uh, well, thank you, Dean Wilson, and good afternoon. On behalf of the University of Texas, I'm uh, very pleased to uh, help open uh, this, uh, this important event. As you know, we are gathered here to commemorate the establishment of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development by President Lyndon B. Johnson on September 9, 1965. As we mark this 50th anniversary of many of LBJ's uh, landmark initiatives in the Great Society, we are honored that Secretary Julian Castro has chosen the LBJ School of Public Policy and our sister institution here at UT Austin, the LBJ Presidential Library, for this truly memorial event. Uh, we remember the Secretary's commencement speech to the LBJ School uh, two years ago, and we are thrilled uh, that you asked to come back to the University of Texas to mark this important anniversary. Uh, as you heard in the film, HUD was an important element of President Johnson's organization and reorganization of the federal government uh, to meet urgent national priorities. And it reflected his personal commitment to address the problems of urban America, 
especially the issues, the serious issues around adequate housing for the disadvantaged and special needs populations in our communities, and the development of low income housing for uh, low income members of our communities. As with many other aspects of the Great Society, President Johnson was motivated by the poverty, the extreme poverty uh, he witnessed both in the Texas Hill Country of his childhood, uh, so close to our city, and in South Texas, the town of Catula, uh, where he taught school. Austin itself was one of the first beneficiaries of HUD initiatives, as you heard from Dean Wilson. Uh, the Rebecca Baines Johnson Center on Interstate 35 and the Lady Bird Lake were one of the first, uh, was one of the first elderly housing uh, projects sponsored by HUD in Texas and it has provided affordable housing uh, for low-income el elderly populations for more than 40 years. Our city, one of the most vibrant cities in the United States, continues to face serious challenges in affordability of housing, and, and we are looking for many of the innovations, the solutions that are emerging from places like the LBJ School of Public Policy. Increasingly, the United States and Texas are uh, uh, communities of city dwellers as the United States has moved from a rural and agricultural country to an urban country. In 1940, 55% of Texans lived in rural areas. Today, it's 88% of Texans live in metropolitan areas. And as cities go, our quality of life and, uh, and our communities goes too. Uh, this is an important issue at one of the preeminent public research universities in the United States, at the University of Texas, and we are deeply focused on these important issues. Uh, numerous examples, but just a few, our School of Architecture has for decades encouraged students to investigate the architecture of cities themselves and the influence of the urban infrastructure, the role of politics and economics on architectural design and hence quality of life. In the College of Liberal Arts, the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis has done some landmark studies on uh, key issues uh, that are facing our community, others around Texas. And the many policy questions, the interdisciplinary policy questions that are being addressed here in the LBJ School of Public Policy. We as a university want to be partners and innovators in developing solutions to society's challenges. I think President Johnson uh, would approve of these efforts at his university and the school named for him and the university that hosts his presidential library. And it's absolutely critical for us to continue as a country uh, to lead in these issues, to have talented leaders like Julian Castro, a great son of Texas, focused on these issues of housing and urban development. Julian Castro was born and raised in San Antonio he earned his degrees at Stanford and Harvard Law. I've heard those are pretty good schools. Uh, before being elected to the San Antonio City Council at the age of 26. In 2009, uh, Castro was elected mayor of San Antonio and was reelected to a second and a third term. And as mayor, uh, he, the mayor became nationally known as a leader in urban development in that great city just 90 minutes from us. On July 28th of last year, President Barack Obama appointed him to lead HUD, where he oversees 8,000 employees and a budget of $46 billion. Now it is my honor to introduce the 16th Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a truly great Texan, the Honorable Julian Castro. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, President Fenves, to Dean Wilson, to all the faculty here at UT, distinguished guests, conferees, and uh, also to members of the HUD team who are watching online. They really are. <laughs> it's a privilege to join you today at the renowned LBJ School of Public Affairs. You know, this isn't my first time here, but, uh, but it's an honor every time I get to visit this lovely place. Uh, in particular, I want to thank all the students. Do we have any students out there? 
You know, I'd, uh, I'd hope to celebrate UT's first football victory of the season, but uh, things didn't quite work out on Saturday. You know, as many of you know, Pope Francis is uh, planning to visit the White House later this month. So uh, don't worry, folks. I plan to launch with him a formal complaint about the Notre Dame football team. <laughs> the good thing is, though, that I have nothing to complain about today. I'm very pleased to be here with uh, so many accomplished UT students. Uh, I know that there's no question that some of Texas's and our nation's next great leaders are with us in this room today. Thank you all for welcoming me, for your commitment to public service, and for celebrating this special anniversary with us this afternoon. On the night of August 11th, 1965, one month before President Lyndon Baines Johnson stepped into the Rose Garden to sign Public Law 89174 that established the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. 21-year-old Marquette Fry was pulled over by a police officer and was arrested for drunk driving. The stop took place at the corner of 116th Street and Avalon Boulevard, a few blocks from the Watts neighborhood in Los Angeles a community long on obstacles and short on opportunities. Marquette was black and the officer was white. And as the arrest unfolded, a crowd started building. 25 people, then 300. And after 45 minutes, the crowd had grown to 1,000 people. And the crowd brought with it more than just curiosity. It brought the pain of enduring discrimination, the sense of hopelessness that comes with joblessness and failing schools and a bleak future, a belief that the whole system was designed to keep them down. And on that hot August day, their frustration escalated into anger. And the, Wyatt, the Watts unrest began. 144 straight hours, 34 people dead, 1,000 injured, 600 buildings damaged. Now, these were the days before the internet, before Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Americans didn't absorb the news on a smartphone by themselves riding on a subway or in a bus or in the back seat of a car. By the mid-1960s, more than half of America got its news from TV newscasters like Walter Cronkite. Imagine entire families in their living rooms watching part of Los Angeles going up in flames. A Newsweek cover captured the mood of a shocked nation with the headline, Los Angeles, why? But the folks living in Watts, they didn't need a headline to alert them to the challenges. They'd spent their entire lives living with them. They'd always wondered why. Why did investments go to the suburbs instead of the inner city? Why did government policies intentionally isolate the poor? Why weren't doors of opportunity open to all Americans, regardless of the color of their skin? Watts revealed a sad truth about the United States in 1965. We were a nation that was at odds with itself the greatest beacon for freedom around the world, yet many of its citizens were oppressed at home. The richest nation on earth, yet millions of people lived in squalor. And cities that soared in the post-World War II economy now suffered from growing poverty, aging infrastructure, 
and a middle class that had left behind the most vulnerable. From all of this, it was clear that the American city needed to be at the top of the national agenda. It needed a champion, a voice in government. So 50 years ago today, President Johnson signed the bill that created HUD, the 11th Cabinet Agency. And although the idea was a decade in the making, HUD came to life out of President Johnson's vision for a great society, his declaration of a war on poverty, and his strong belief in government's power to right wrongs and to help expand opportunity for all Americans. What the hell is the presidency for if not to fight for the causes you believe in, he once told his aides. And he did fight, and he won. Head Start, Medicare, Medicaid, Student Aid, Job Corps, VISTA, Civil Rights, Voting Rights. Johnson chalked up, chalked up all of those victories and more for the American people. He even sought to solve problems that weren't quite as obvious. One day, for example, while trying to reach his aide, Joseph Califano, Johnson learned that Califano was at the hospital with his two-year-old son who had swallowed a bottle of aspirin. The president was outraged when he learned about this, and he said that, quote, these bottles ought to be made so that kids can't open them. And soon, the Child Safety Act of 1966 was law, which is why all of us now find it a little bit tougher to open our Tylenol bottles. <laughs> President Johnson viewed government as an institution, an instrument of good. And that's a belief that's made a difference in cities and towns across the nation. The poverty rate is 40% lower today than in the 1960s. And generations of Americans have benefited from his efforts in the classroom, in the workplace, with their health care, and beyond. And without question, the creation of HUD deserves a place among the great society's most important accomplishments. But if President Johnson were here today, I think he'd look at the greatest democracy the world has ever produced and say, Mr. Secretary, we've made progress, but we're nowhere close to being done. Then he'd probably throw in a few cuss words, too, just for effect. He would see what we all see, but we don't often like to talk about. He would look outside these doors across I-35 to East Austin. On the one hand, I bet he'd be amazed to see the change in landscape, new apartments next to new restaurants and growing businesses. But President Johnson would also ask the tough questions. What are we doing for the East Austinites who have lived there for generations? Can they afford the rising rents Will they be there to experience the rebirth and revitalization of their own neighborhood? And the thing is, I'm not picking on Austin. This contradiction is an American reality today. On the one hand, we're living in a century of cities, a time when people around the world and here in the United States are falling in love with cities again. The Census Bureau projects that by 2050, our nation's population will grow by 80 million people, 60 million of whom are likely to live in urban areas. Today, we view cities as places of possibility, where creativity and culture flow, where ideas and imagination are brought to life. Places like Austin. But today, we also face a growing gap between the rich and the poor, between those who have opportunity and those who don't. 
The issues we saw in Watts 50 years ago are still very much relevant today, as all of us have seen with events in recent months. Too often, a child's zip code determines their future. In fact, a few months ago, I visited Ferguson, Missouri, and I heard the most sobering statistic that a child born in the Jeff Vanderloop community in zip code 63105 in North St. Louis can expect to live 18 years less than a child born 10 miles away in zip code 63105 in the more affluent Clayton community. Think about that. President Obama has said that solving inequality is, quote, the defining challenge of our time. And our nation must answer this call by breaking down barriers that hold folks down and shut them out, by providing every person with an equal shot at real opportunity, an equal shot at the American dream. And HUD is determined to do its part to level the playing field. Last week, I had the great honor of introducing former Vice President Walter Mondale, the co-author of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, at a conference at HUD, HUD, HUD headquarters. For nearly 50 years, working with our partners, we've done some good work to punish those who discriminate against others in the housing market because of what they look like, or where they come from, or how they worship. But it's not enough to wait until after wrongdoing occurs. Local communities that get HUD funding are required to use HUD taxpayer dollars in a way that promotes equal opportunity. In the past, that hadn't happened enough or in enough communities. Some local officials chose to invest in certain neighborhoods and not others, oftentimes for the wrong reasons. Many who had good intentions didn't know where to put their money. And truth be told, HUD hadn't overseen this effort with enough consistency or forcefulness. Today, communities remain highly segregated by race, by national origin, by income. And as Dr. King once said, as long as there is residential segregation, there will be de facto segregation in every aspect of American life. For years and years, folks have worked to change this, often in the face of great resistance. Delay after delay, try after try, but not anymore. I was happy to look Vice President Mondale in the eye and tell him that in July, HUD finally issued its new rule to ensure that our dollars are used in a way that expands opportunity for every single American in the United States. But announcements are easy. It's the implementation, the follow-through, that is hard. Despite the unrest that we've seen in Baltimore and Ferguson, there will be those who call our efforts social engineering, tipping the scales. There will be those who say it's a bureaucratic burden. To them, I simply say, we can't afford to wait anymore. America can't afford another half century of what was, in the most charitable language, benign neglect. Our new fair housing rule sends a strong message, loud and clear to our partners, that we're going to work with you to ensure that you use taxpayer dollars prudently to invest in housing, in infrastructure, in transit, in good schools, in economic development, so that folks can build prosperous futures. And that's just the beginning. 
Our opportunity agenda is guided by three principles designed to ensure that the disinvestment and disappointment that's marked too much of our nation's past comes to an end once and for all. The first is that as we seek to lift up communities and boost upward mobility, we're also breaking through the silos of bureaucracy with a holistic approach. As President Obama has said, if poverty is a disease that infects an entire community in the form of unemployment and violence and failing schools, broken homes, we can't just treat those symptoms in isolation. We have to heal the entire community. You see, it's not just about housing or improving education or enhancing access to transit or sparking job creation. We have to do all of those things. We have to accomplish each and every one of those in order to truly improve the economic prospects and quality of life in our nation's most distressed communities. I'm confident that this approach will be one of the hallmarks, one of the legacies of the Obama administration. Sustainable communities, choice neighborhoods, strong cities, strong communities. Through these initiatives and others, we're cutting across the bureaucratic lines, HUD, energy, EPA, education, transportation, all of us working together. And we're also challenging local communities to organize their own efforts in this way. And I'm pleased to say that this approach is paying off. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Boston's Dorchester neighborhood where business, government, education, and community leaders are joining together to create a prosperous future for a historically impoverished area. New housing for low and middle income families, new investments in education for children and for adults, new businesses and new jobs, new green spaces and community facilities. Because of their efforts, optimism is rising, opportunity is expanding, and we're going to keep working with local partners to boost upward mobility and break down those bureaucratic barriers that have long hindered progress. The second challenge we must address is a more straightforward one, but just as important. We have to measure results better. At HUD, we help put a roof over one's head. That's a great victory. So that's one way to measure success. But as we move forward with a holistic approach, we really need to understand more. In addition to outputs, we've got to measure outcomes. How much of a difference do our investments make to increase the high school graduation rate? How many working age residents of public housing or residents within a promise zone go back and get their GED? or go to college, or get technical training that lands them a job, or gets them a better job than the one they have now? How much are our investments reducing the rate of asthma in children, or helping increase the life expectancy of the millions of seniors that we serve? How much are we reducing the cost to Medicare and Medicaid by providing good, supportive housing for the elderly? Successfully tracking these outcomes will help us better understand what's working and improve programs that don't work or eliminate them altogether. In this resource-constrained environment, being able to demonstrate success with strong evidence just makes sense. And at HUD, I'm glad to say that we're taking this challenge seriously. A few years ago, under the leadership of Secretary Sean Donovan, we launched HUDSTAT, a tool to gauge our progress. Today, we're expanding HUDSTAT to better measure economic, education, and quality of life outcomes. We're going to invest in what works, change what doesn't, and improve our own operations to continue improving the lives of the American people. 
And third, we have to strike a balance between, on the one hand, providing low-income families with greater mobility, the option through housing choice vouchers to move to areas of higher opportunity within a metro area, and on the other, reinvesting in older, distressed neighborhoods. Today, where a family lives matters profoundly to their future. For example, groundbreaking research by Harvard professor Raj Chetty recently found that children under 13 who moved out of extreme poverty into a better neighborhood went on to earn 31% more than children who remained. So we want to get families to higher opportunity neighborhoods within metro areas. And today, over 40% of HUD's budget is dedicated to vouchers. But every time we raise the issue of mobility, a question rises from the back of the room. What about those families that don't want to leave their neighborhood? Maybe they've lived there for generations. It's home to them. It's part of who they are. Shouldn't we be doing something for them as well? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. We can't and we shouldn't just seek to move everybody out. We can't forget about these residents in these neighborhoods. Through community development block grants, home funds, and our place-based efforts, HUD is investing over $4 billion this year to lift up distressed neighborhoods throughout the United States. And we have to keep doing so year after year, renovating old housing stock and creating new affordable housing, repairing old infrastructure and investing in public schools. For East Austin and places like it, we ought to improve the neighborhoods for the sake and for the benefit of East Austinites who have long called that neighborhood home. We can do that in East Austin and similar communities, and we can make them inviting to newcomers as well. Six months before the bill giving life to HUD, President Johnson addressed a joint session of Congress just days after the bloody Sunday march in Selma. And that night, he challenged lawmakers to pass what would become the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In his remarks, he spoke about his own life. He recalled that his first job was as a young teacher in the small Texas town of Catula. His students were Mexican-American, and they were poor. He said that every day he could see in their eyes the pain of the discrimination they faced, and that he asked himself what else he could possibly do to help them out. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965, President Johnson told the American people that night. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country, he said. The thing is, as we stand here in 2015, you don't have to be a president to make a difference. We all have that chance. Every day at HUD, more than 8,000 Americans go to work, and they make a difference. Because of their work and the work of many others, their mothers and their children, veterans and seniors, poor and middle class, who have a place to call home tonight. There are young couples who will buy their first home tomorrow morning. And cities, big and small, that will grow stronger because we're investing in them. I'm proud to say that we are the legacy of Linden. 
And you are too. Each and every one of you are difference makers. As public servants, as educators, as activists, as business owners, as journalists, as young men and young women who care about seeing to it that others coming behind you are as blessed with opportunity as you have been. No matter where they live, how much money they have, or the color of their skin. At the end of his speech, Lyndon Johnson said that he was proud to have that chance to make a difference. And then he said, and I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. And that is my hope for you, that with all your talent and your intelligence, your compassion and your drive, and that in all the years to come, that you will always use it too. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.